So our group is working on a novel multi-platform sensing gel. Uh, the problem we wanted to solve was for mainly lab technicians who need to test, say, concentration in a sample or the presence of a molecule in a sample. Currently, the only methods to do this are mass spectroscopy. It's expensive, time-consuming, you need training, and it's very difficult to do. So we wanted to build a simple, easy solution to get quick results for that. To achieve this, we've identified a number of key customer requirements that must be met. The sample testing must be inexpensive. We want it to be less than about $5 per test. It must be simple, so it can be done in a one to three step process. It must be fast, so it be let, you get results in less than 10 minutes. Accurate, so to define this, we decided we needed a specificity of more than 90%, a sensitivity of greater than 60%, and a positive predictive value of 85%. This basically ensures that if your sample changes color, you know that it worked. Uh, repeatability, we want, less, we want less than 1% variation, so again, you can ensure that your samples are always working, and the solution needs to be scalable so it can be implemented in the right uh, places. So the design plan, we sort of broke these concepts down into how we wanted to achieve them. Uh, the first one was to make it simple. So we wanted to do a visual color change, and we wanted to make it an easy, simply inject a liquid sample and go kind of solution. To make it scalable, we decided to use a gel formulation. Uh, this makes it easy to test samples so you, since you can directly inject your liquid sample into a gel. It also makes it easy for transport and cost reasons. You can dehydrate the gel into a powder, and then you can easily transport that, store it. It's just uh, very low weight, very low space. And then it's also processable because it's a gel, it's all polymers, so you can make it fairly readily. So our design, this is sort of how we imagine the final product to kind of look like. You have sort of a microfluidic card system with an injection port, some channels, a, a section for the gel, and then a reservoir. And in the sensor, we'd have our gel sensor that would change from colorless to a magenta pink color when presence of sample was detected or it reached a certain concentration limit. So the way we're gonna, I'm gonna go through sort of the background and some of the science behind how this works. So we built our detection mechanism based on the molecules phenylphalein and cyclodextrin. And I'm gonna talk about each one individually and how they work together to achieve this goal. So phenylphalein is actually a pH indicator, pretty commonly used. Uh, at low pHs, it has this molecular structure where it has these different rings formed together. And you can see in the center, there's uh, this carbon that's kind of bonded up in four ways. In this position, the phenylphalein molecule absorbs UV light, so it appears colorless to our eyes. But when you add base to the solution, you actually deprotonate some of the hydroxyl groups on the phenylphalein, and this causes a conformation shift that makes it turn magenta. So what's actually happening is essentially a resonance structure and electronic structure of the molecule is changing. We simulated this using a program called Gaussian 09, and basically what happens is in low pH form, which you see on the left, it's uh, sp3 hybridization on the center carbon, which means you have a very wide band gap and you're absorbing in the UV range. However, when you add base and you deprotonate it, you now get this resonance. Uh, the red color of the molecule is just showing where the electron density is, and so you can see it's actually all around the molecule. It's, it's resonating around it. This increases the conjugation of the system, decreasing the band gap, which means you absorb in the optical range, giving it its color. Now, phenylphalein is not the only thing that can do this. It's actually sort of a template, and there's other phthalein molecules uh, that can do similar things. They just have different pending groups. So alpha naphthalein can change from sort of a colorless to a cyan color. Ocresylphthalein can change from a colorless to a purple color. And they all have their own sort of respective pH ranges that they do this. Now, the other molecule we want to look at is cyclodextrin. Cyclodextrin is an interestingly shaped molecule. It has this sort of cavity pocket formation. And there's three different kinds. There's alpha, beta, gamma. And it's just sort of this collection of uh, sugar molecules into this ring. And in e each of the alpha, beta, gamma are actually increasing in size, both in the molecule size and in the cavity size. Now, the interesting about this is molecules can bind inside this cavity because the cavity is actually hydrophobic, whereas the outside of it is a hydrophilic uh, system. So when you mix cyclodextrin and phenophalin together, they actually will complex together. It happens with a, with a rate constant or a binding energy of around 10 to the 3, so it's about 1,000. It's pretty strong. Uh, research literature states it's hydrogen bonding system between the cavity and the molecule. And what's happening is it actually forces that ring closure on the molecule to go back, meaning that the molecule turns colorless again when cyclodextrin is added, even in high pH. This binding tends to happen in a one-to-one -one ratio, so it's always, it's used actually fairly commonly in literature to characterize systems and determine concentrations, which use this, um, which use either of these molecules. Here's an example of just another list of many other tables, or many other molecules that also bind to cyclodextrin, and they all have their own sort of respective binding affinities. Caffeine is on the order of 10 to the 2. 
uh, as I mentioned, phenyl phalanx on 10 to the 3, and there's, there's many, many others. These are just a few examples. So the way that we're building a sensor out of this is if you have a solution in high pH of phenylphthalein and cyclodextrin, it's colorless. Now if you add in a new molecule, which has a higher binding affinity for the cyclodextrin than the phenylphthalein, it will kick out the phenylphthalein and replace it in the complex. This will now make it so that you have free phenylphthalein in basic solution, which will give you your pink color back. So in this case, we use the adamantinol molecule. It has a binding constant on the order of 10 to the 4, and <clears throat> uh, you, you get the pink color. So the way we wanted to integrate this was to build an actual gel directly with these molecules. So we wanted to build two polymer backbones, one containing phenylphthalein pendant groups and one containing cyclodextrin pendant groups, such that when you mix the two polymers together, they cross-link into a gel. This would be chemical sensitive. It could be temperature sensitive, especially if you use temperature sensitive backbones. Uh, it could be mechanically responsive. So if you cut the gel, it might change color along the interface where you broke those complexes. And it might also be self-healing. So if you put the gels together, these complexes can reform and the gel would come back together. So this was sort of the overall goal of the project. We started by synthesizing the two polymers. So the first one we did was a, a PVBC. It's polyvinyl benzyl chloride. We reacted it with phenylphthalein. And at the bottom right, you can see sort of the results. Um, we precipitated and filtered the polymer. We redissolved it. And then we did dialysis. We put in a dialysis bag. And the reason for this was to remove excess phenylphthalein and to show that it was bound to the polymer. So the dialysis bag has pores which allow the phenylphthalein to leave, but do not allow the polymer to exit. And you can see on the first day, the whole solution is very dark. But we changed the, the solution bath over many days, and we do the dialysis. And by the end, you can see the bag in the center is still very dark, meaning that there's polymer with phenylphthalein on it. And the outside is very clear, meaning that there's no more excess phenylphthalein leaving the bag. So the second step was to get the cyclodextrin functionalized polymer to work as well. Uh, this required a two-step process of functionalizing the cyclodextrin with an amine group. So first you tosylate it, and then you can replace the tosylated group with an amine. <clears throat> and then the next step was then to react this to another polymer. In this case, we chose PGMA. This was rec recommended to us by some of the grad students we were working, or we were in TAMS lab, who kind of helped us out with this a little bit. And the idea was the amine group is just a very common reaction with the ring opening of the PGMA. The problem with the final polymer that we got is that we actually couldn't dissolve it in anything. We tried all kinds of solvents, all kinds of different ratios of solvents, and it just wouldn't dissolve. We also tried uh, grafting it to PVBC, the same polymer we used for the phenylphthalein molecule, and the same results. We think we got it to work. Um, it does kind of quench the color when you mix it, but it just isn't very good at dissolving. All right. So even though the uh, PBBC and PGMA mixed with beta cyclodextrin uh, seemed insoluble, we still tried very hard to mix it with the original PBBC bound to the uh, phenylphthalein molecules in order to try and get some kind of a prototype. Um, we mixed them kind of under heat and agitation in order to still try and promote some kind of solubility. Um, but in the end, what we ended up with was just a slightly more viscous fluid. There was not really any gelation occurring, uh, and there are a couple of reasons why that could be occurring. Uh, it's possibly due to the low molecular weight of the polymers, or our cross-linking density was just too low. At this point in the project, though, we were starting to run out of time and resources, so we didn't continue heading down this avenue in order to try and fix this, pro uh, this prototype. Instead, we turned our attention to a new type of prototype. Um, we wanted to use we decided to use a gelatin matrix instead. Uh, gelatin is a naturally uh, derived hydrogel made out of collagen fibers. Um, and we injected it with our phenophthalein and beta cyclodextrin complex uh, so that it was embedded into the hydrogel. Um, we saw that upon the addition of adamantanol into this gel, um, we did actually see a color change. Um, we ended up with an experimental detection limit, but I'll talk about that later on. Uh, the picture in the bottom right shows the normal gel with the phenophthalein and beta cyclodextrin comp uh, complex inside of it, and the one on the left shows uh, the addition of adamantanol with a color change. So this one had some advantages in that we actually had gelation occur, uh, and since the gelatin is a pre-made hydrogel, it made um, production much easier uh, and much more cost effective. But some of the disadvantages we ended up with is that it, it becomes um, not mechanically responsive because we don't have the phenophthalein and the beta cyclodextrin actually acting as cross-linking agents for the hydrogel itself. But moving forward, <clears throat> we did UV spectroscopy um, on the samples. We produced four samples. We had a blank sample, one with phenophthalein, one with uh, beta cyclodextrin added, and then one with adamantanol added, just to really prove the concept that 
if we added the beta cyclodextrin first, we will see a quenching of the color, and then when we add an adamantanol, it should come back. Now, the way that we see this in the UV vis uh, spectroscopy, if I go to the results, you'll see that uh, in the picture on the right with the pH um, TH solution added, uh, we end up with a peak that's around 530 nanometers. This corresponds to the absorbance of green light in the solution, and we end up with a reflectance of the magenta light, which is characteristic of phenophthalene. Uh, and then if we move on, when we add beta cyclodextrin, we see a severe reduction in the size of that peak. Um, it doesn't go quite perfectly clear in our case, but it's drastically uh, significant. And then upon addition of the adamantanol, we see a spike in the peak again. So that was mainly our proof of concept. Now if we go back to our customer requirements that we stated at the, original, at the uh, beginning of the presentation, one of the first things we wanted to really test was how long it would take for the sample to change color. Because this is important. We wouldn't, want it, we wouldn't want you to inject your sample, walk away, and forget about it when it takes 10 minutes in order to change color. So we tested it across 25 samples, and we saw that on average um, we achieved a full color change in about a minute. The pictures on the bottom show this, uh, show one of, actually the screenshots taken from one of our videos. Uh, on the left is the, the initial state of both of the samples. On the right, the left sample is um, a control, whereas the right sample had uh, adamantanol added to it. Next, we wanted to look at the cost. Uh, this is a fairly large breakdown of all of the chemicals necessary in order to make the gel itself. Um, but we um, focused it down to a volume of about a milliliter or a centimeter cubed, which we figured would be small enough to kind of limit the cost while also being large enough that the color change should be visible to the human eye. And this brought the chemical cost down to about six cents, which is fairly inexpensive. Finally, the major point that we wanted to hit was we wanted to make this system easy to use. We wanted it to not only be accessible to people in a lab situation, but also to regular consumers or people who potentially are living in a third world country. Um, so for our proof of concept, when we used adamantanol in order to show the color change, it's essentially a one-step process. We take the adamantanol in solution, inject it straight into the hydrogel, and it's done. But with this technology, we could effectively um, sense for any molecule uh, that pretty much is conceivable simply by tethering it to a molecule that we know exists. Um, since this is a chemical reaction, it might add potentially one or two extra steps onto it, but that should still be easy enough for uh, a regular consumer to, uh, to perform at home. So moving on, we wanted to look at the accuracy of our sample. Uh, and to do this, we looked at the sensitivity, specificity, and intersample variation. Um, in the picture on the left, you can see our specificity and sensitivity um, results. Um, columns H, G, and D, which I think are readable up there, um, show samples that had a very specific concentration of adamantanol added. As you can see, there was complete color change, which results in 100% um, specificity. But in columns F, E, C, and B, uh, there was a blank sample added in order to make sure that there was nothing else in solution that could potentially be causing false positives to occur. Um, and since none of them changed color, as expected, we ended up with a sensitivity of 100%. Um, finally, on the right, we can see our intersample variation. This was just really to make sure that if we tested the same sample of adamantanol over and over and over and over again, we would still see a color change, and again, nothing would be kind of interrupting this. Finally, um, with our testing, we moved on to our detection limit testing. As we stated before, we wanted to make sure that the color change was visible to the human eye. This needed to be something that could be done by a person um, with you know, little to no chemistry background. So we tested a wide range of um, concentrations of adamantanol added to the gel. And as we can see, as the concentration decreases, it hits a threshold where the color change becomes insignificant. And this is generally at about five micromolar. Um, now, this detection limit can also be tailored based on the amount of phenophthalene and beta-cyclodextrin that are already in the gel. Um, by lowering that, we can actually also effectively lower the detection limit. Now, onto our future work for this. We want to go back and recreate the original idea of having the phenophthalene and beta-cyclodextrin molecules bound to the polymer chains. We wanted to try and get that mechanoresponsive polymer and, and the self-healing hydrogel. Um, there are some ways that we could look at doing that, and again, we, we want the following properties um, from this hydrogel system. 
Also, in our future work, we wanted to look at specific examples of tethering additional molecules um, to this system. There are other molecules that can outcompete phenophthalene in uh, in solution, but specifically, the tethering of additional molecules might become the more important avenue as this allows for many more molecules to be tested. Also, we wanted to finally construct the test housing, which was shown earlier, um, potentially uh, trying to maximize the, the type of material used, uh, the dimensions, trying to um, see whether or not we could potentially use a removable reaction chamber and dispose of the hydrogel center without having to get rid of the entire card. Um, we'd like to thank Dr. Nasser uh, Abudir and Dr. Michael Tam for being our consultant and technical advisor, respectively. Um, thank you guys for listening, and we'd like to open the floor to questions. So there's, we see two major applications for this uh, in the current form. So the first is almost like a, like you know how pH paper is sort of ubiquitous in the lab? Imagine a, a gel like this that's ubiquitous. So you want to see, oh, is my concentration less than five millimolar or more than five millimolar? You could use it for that. You want to know, is there a contaminant? If the contaminant will compete with the cyclodextrin or if you can tag it, you could determine is the contaminant present in a lab setting. Another setting we see being useful for would be in third world countries as a detection for uh, it could even be for counterfeit drugs. Drugs are actually a good application because they don't have a lot of other, like a lot of, a lot of what a drug contains is just sort of starches and what makes up the pill and then the active ingredient. And a lot of active ingredients actually bind very well with cyclodextrin. Um, it's commonly used as a way to solubilize many drugs. And so you could basically detect if your uh, sample contains the active ingredient or not by running that test. And this is important for things like in Africa, for example, there's a very common form of birth control and 30% of the birth control on the pharmacy shelves are actually counterfeit. And they're counterfeit in the way that they have no active ingredient. So this would be a way, to, for example, in that specific application where you could send this to Africa, they could take their pill that they just bought, dissolve it in water, and then just inject it in a gel and see if the gel doesn't change color, they know that their birth control is inactive. So that's an application outside of the lab setting as well. The thing is, is I don't think it's necessarily so much, um, we're not trying to create this so much to be in competition with mass spec. It's more to work alongside as kind of a quicker one-step test that you could do uh, to detect something very quickly instead of having to run a, a massive um, expensive process like mass spec. Uh, and also in conjunction, it means that since it's cheaper and quicker, we could potentially, uh, it's much easier to mobilize to people, say, in such like a third world country or something. Um, so it's, it's not really meant to replace it, uh, per se. For the, for the final gel idea? Yeah, for the, well, the one that's working right now. So the one that's working right now is basically just a gelatin matrix. So it's a gelatin hydrogel with a solution of phenolphthalein and cyclodextrin just sort of swollen, swells the gel. Okay, so, so it's not chemically bound. It's, just yeah. it's not chemically bound currently, no. For the, for the sake of sort of meeting the customer requirements on time and having a proof of concept, we just did it that way. That's also why we lose like the mechanical uh, responsiveness of the gel and the uh, potential self healing of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to a polymer. So we we did actually get. Uh, let me just get back to it. So we. Yeah. So it has really interesting properties that are kind of hard to explain um, for from this project. Like for example, it, it kind of separates oddly in different solvents with even just like ethanol and water. It can kind of separate the two. Um, so it had some interesting properties like that. And it did do the color change kind of like we expected. It was also a little bit sylvatochromatic, but so is phenolphthalein. Um, <clears throat> so this, this did work, uh, but this part, we just couldn't solubilize this polymer. 
we, did, we do think we got it to work once in one solvent. Um, the problem is then it came out as a thick liquid and it was really hard to try and separate it out from the rest of the solution, so it wasn't really useful. So what happens if you try to mix the cyclodextrin with the polymer and then the polymer quench the color? Yeah, so it, it does quench the color, yeah. All right, I guess uh, 